Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Our next conversation is going to the value of the Naira. Reports have it yesterday that the Naira was exchanging at between 543 or 545 Naira to the dollar. The Nigerian government has, over time, made different moves and you know, set up committees, um, you know, created new laws with regards to protecting the Naira from its free fall that we're currently witnessing. But that doesn't seem to be working. We're speaking this morning with an economist, Muda Yusuf, who's a, a former DG of the Lagos uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning, Dr. Good morning, and, and thank you for having me. All right, you're welcome. Um, so I'm going to you know, get you to you know, start with your views on what seems to be going on with the Naira. Um, we maybe weren't expecting it to be this bad you know, a few years ago, but we're currently at 543 or 545, and you know, there are fears that it might even hit 600 and more um, in the next few months. What seems to be going on? Well, uh, what is going on, uh, we can say it's a combination of factors. It's a combination of factors such as the capacity of the economy to generate foreign exchange. Then there is also a regulatory or policy dimension to it. So basically, uh, it's a combination of those two factors the capacity to generate foreign exchange to meet the demand and the appropriateness of policy framework that will uh, inspire confidence and ensure stability uh, in the foreign exchange market. Don't forget, exchange rate is a price. And uh, in elementary economics, the price is determined by demand and supply. So you have factors on the demand side, which is very heavy because of the demand for all manner of things that we import. Then we have factors on the supply side, you know, which has to do with variables around those economic activities that generate foreign exchange. Then there's a third leg of it, which is the monetary factor. That is how we manage the economy, especially around monetary policy and around the financing of a deficit by the central bank. That also has an influence on what you call money supply. So if the money supply is getting too high, it has a way of affecting both inflation and the exchange rates. So basically, we will locate what is happening around those three critical uh, factors. Okay. Uh, as we progress, we can elaborate on the key elements of each of those factors. Okay. So, so Mr. Yusuf, let, let's um, you know start with uh, focus on the policies um, and policy framework of the you know, Nigerian government, the CBN governor inclusive, and also um, certain you know um, 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 economic teams that have been set up over time. Um, there have been certain policies that were, you know, at first a little shocking to Nigerian people by the CBN governor. Um, these policies were, you know, at that time meant to help stop the uh, free fall of the Naira and to give the Naira more value. But these don't seem to be working. So would you say that the policies have failed, you know, uh, to address these challenges? Or the CBN just didn't, you know, time these policies uh, Perfectly. And what I will say is that we have some major shortcomings with the policy. Uh, generally, the kind of policy framework that is being adopted is what we call or what you can describe as an administrative allocation of foreign exchange as opposed to a market-based uh, framework for the management of foreign exchange. Administrative allocation is generally and typically very, very challenging. Because when you fix your rates, because what you have now essentially is 
administrative fixing of the estate rate. When you fix your rates at a level that the supply cannot support, then you find yourself in a situation where, where you begin to ration foreign exchange. And the immediate impact of that, first, because the rate is artificial, I'm talking of the official window rate now. Yes. Because the rate is artificial and it doesn't reflect fundamentals, it fuels a lot of speculation. It attracts a lot of parasites, a lot of people who have some influence and all of that to get the foreign exchange because there is the opportunity of run tripping the foreign exchange. Now, the official window now is around 411. The open market rate now is around 538. That's that today. You can see the gap. Once you have this kind of gap, you have a subsidy challenge. That is what you call the subsidized exchange rate. And once you have that, you see a lot of scramble of foreign exchange. Even from people who don't have any serious need for them. They are in the market because they want to take advantage of the premium between that official window and the open market window. That is one problem with the current policy. The second problem is that when you fix a rate below what is regarded as the market rate, those that are supposed to bring in foreign exchange into the economy will not bring those foreign exchange. Because how will you bring your foreign exchange when you know that the open market rate is 538 and the authorities are saying that you should bring in your foreign exchange at 411? This is a disincentive to supply. So, so when you have this kind of things, mm -hmm. you create a major crisis. You create a problem on the supply side because people who are supposed to bring in the supply, and I can name them, like the oil and gas companies, like the embassies. We have foreign direct investment. We have foreign portfolio investment. We have the export proceeds. We have the diaspora remittances. Yes. We have the embassies. All of these are channels through which foreign exchange come in. But if you are imposing a rate on them, that if they bring in the foreign exchange, You'll be extending for them at 411. Two things will happen. Is that they don't bring it at all, or they bring it under the table, which is the crisis we are having. So, if you have a market based mechanism, a less regulated system, where you allow the markets to determine things, you are likely to see a much better improvement on the supply side. So, that is about supply. Now, on the demand side, one of the biggest pressures we are having on our foreign estate is the importation of petroleum products. Our refineries are not working. The Dangote refinery is here to come on stream. And we are consuming, as there are some figures now, ranging between 90 million to 100 million liters every day. That's a lot of pressure on our foreign exchange. And because the government doesn't want a crisis, around fuel queues and all of that, government keeps pumping a lot of foreign exchange to the importation of petroleum products. Well, you know, so there's that also arguments that, that, that Nigeria, you know, itself may not really consume as much as 90 million liters. And so there's also some challenges with those figures and, you know, how, you know the need to also cut them down. But, but go ahead. Um, um, and I want you to also add yeah, to your the, thoughts. The, 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 the point is that, the point is that, once you have, that is another pricing problem. Yes. Because the uh, price of fuel is also heavily subsidized. It is far cheaper than the fuel that you have in our neighboring countries. Yes. So what happens is that once the fuel comes in, the, the fuel finds its way into all the countries in this West African sub region, and even sometimes even to North Africa, because you have economic agents who move distance. So these things are putting a lot of pressure on the foreign exchange market. Then if you look at even our manufacturing sector, a lot of the raw materials that are used in manufacturing are also important. 
because we don't, uh, we don't have a properly functioning petrochemical sector. We have one somewhere in uh, on or something, but the capacity is not enough to be able to cope the demands. So there's a lot of pressure also coming from the manufacturers for their inputs and raw materials. The same thing with the equipment that all economic agents use, whether you are in manufacturing, whether you are in agriculture, whether you are in the service sector, most of those machineries and equipment are imported. That's another source of pressure. All right. Then we have finished goods. People buy all sorts of things, go to China, bring in all sorts of things to be sold in China because they are cheaper. So we have challenges on the demand side. We have challenges on the supply side. What the CBN has been trying to do is to manage demand. That is why the CBN has been banning some imports, excluding some people from the foreign exchange market and all of that. That is still not achieving the right kind of outcomes mm. because we are not dealing with fundamentals. There's a limit to which you can do. And what we are having now is that most of these foreign exchange transactions are even taking place outside the official system. If you talk to a lot of people now, they get somebody abroad who has foreign exchange, you do a kind of swap, you credit a particular account here, yeah. they give you dollars over right there. And these, these are all sorts of things that are happening. Just because we don't allow the market to function. If we allow a, a, a better market framework, the situation will not be as bad as it is. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Muda Yusuf, would you argue that Nigeria is currently facing a currency crisis? And more, important, more importantly, who would you say profits from the free fall of the Naira? Well, I won't say we have a... This is not... We can't say this is a currency crisis. I think for me, it's an economic management issue to a large extent. If we manage the economy better, we will not have the kind of challenges that we are having. Because this economy is very big and it has a lot of opportunities to attract private capital. Either through the channel of foreign direct investment, through the channels of uh, foreign portfolio investment, through the challenge of export, I mean, through the channel of export process, through the oil companies, through the embassies. The opportunities are huge. This market is big. The, the population is huge. All of these things bring value. So I won't say it's a currency crisis. I think it is an economic management crisis. And now from the monetary management point of view, the rate at which the government or the CBN is also funding the fiscal deficit of government. When I say that, I rate at which the government is borrowing from the CBN is also too high. And when the CPM continues to fund the deficit or borrows government, I mean borrows money to government, it has a way of weakening the currency. Because so, it's, it, 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 it boosts the money supply. And once money supply continues to accelerate and output is not growing, then you have a challenge with currency. And that is why there is a lot of problem now around the, 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 the welfare of the people around the purchasing power, around the inflation, and these things are creating a lot of problems around the poverty in the country. Because nominal incomes are not increasing, and prices are increasing in a galloping way. There is no better, I mean, there is no greater uh, enemy of the poor than inflation. So, Mr. Um, Dr. When your income is fixed, or your income is even declining, and, and, and you continue to have uh, this high, high prices. Okay, Dr. Some Muda prices have doubled, some prices have tripled in the last uh, in, in the last one year. Hmm. So, so that leads to the next the next part of my question. We know that weaker the weaker rates um, seems to boost government revenue earnings regarding oil. So that's why I'm asking, who really stands to profit from all of this? Well, in terms of who is profiting, first, those who are around tripping, those who have the influence to access foreign exchange in the official window, 
they are the major beneficiaries. Because many of them get this foreign exchange from the official window and find a way to take advantage of the premium, which is not a legitimate kind of benefit anyway. That is one group of beneficiaries. The other group, which for me is legitimate, is those who are exporters. Even though they have a whole lot of challenges in the processes of exporting. But as an exporter, an exporter benefits from a weakening currency. The weaker the currency, the better for an exporter. Because exporters are earning foreign exchange. So when the exchange rate is weakening, the Naira returns on every export is much bigger. So right now, those who are in the export business are doing very well if they have the opportunity to export. All right. Well, but every say. Naira you are able to, I mean, every dollar you bring in, you are talking of over 500 Naira. Yeah. No, no, I, 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 want us to, I want us to also look at... Um, uh, you know, uh, the CBN governor, Godwin MFLA, and some of the uh, moves that he has made, you know, in the last, let's say, one year, um, the, the um, you know, ban on cryptocurrency trading and also uh, the CBN, um, you know, ban on uh, FX to uh, BDCs. How have these affected, you know, and um, also led to this uh, crisis with the Naira that we're currently witnessing? Well, as you can see, we are not getting any concrete results from it. If the policies we are working, we will not be discussing what we are discussing. Before the exclusion of uh, the BDCs, the rates were less than 500, I think 480, 470, you know, 460 and all of that. Now we have removed the BDCs because we felt that we are the one, we are the problems. The transactions were moved to the banks. Then what are you having now? The situation has further deteriorated. But but, but let, so let, let, that let me take understand. Back to the issue of addressing fundamentals. What we are dealing with are the symptoms. If you continue to tackle the symptom of a problem, the problem will not go away until you deal with the causes. And the causes is the fact that we are fixing an exchange rate at a rate that the market, the supply, cannot support. And you create all sorts of problems. So what do you How many recommend? fires will you fight? What do you recommend? Now you Dr. say Lisa? the BDCs are not doing it well, we remove them. Now we there was an issue also about the fintech. They are doing something around foreign exchange. Some sanctions were also threatened. Now there was also issues about microfinance banks that they are doing something around forex. Now the banks are being instructed to go and uh, publish the list of people who are coming with multiple passports, you know. All sorts of problems. It's because we are fighting symptoms. We are fighting symptoms and don't deal with the fundamentals. These problems will not go away. So my solution to this, as much as possible, first, is to adopt a market-based foreign exchange ma ma management framework. If, you, if it is more market-based, if the exchange rates are more market-driven, that's it's one way out of all these challenges. The second is to see how we can accelerate the process of getting our refineries to work, although that's not a short term thing. Because the pressure that importation of petroleum products is putting on the forest market is enormous. Thank God we are looking forward to Dangote refinery. Hopefully that will come upstream next year. Then the government is also making efforts to fix our domestic refining. If we are able to do that, it take a lot of pressure out of you know, a lot of pressure away from the foreign exchange market. Oh, and we need to also correct some, you know, the orientation of our manufacturers as much as possible. We should have an industrial policy that encourages backward integration, so that the manufacturing system is also not too dependent. On imports, if anything, they should be generating. They should be generating foreign exchange. So these are some of the things, and of course, we need to deal with the monetary aspects. The rate at which the CBN is funding fiscal deficit is affecting money supply. It's affecting inflation, and it's also contributing to the depreciation of the exchange rates. 
So you can see that it's, 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 it's a multi-dimensional thing. So if you want to deal with this problem, I think these are the dimensions that you should be focusing on. Well, Mother Yusuf, what fears do you have if we don't start to take some of the steps that you've uh, mentioned here? Uh, because, you know, and I've repeatedly said this, that there's an economic management team, there is, you know, different committees that have been set up, headed by, you know, people who you, you know, would expect, you know, are knowledgeable with managing a, an economy. But, you know, these teams don't seem to be influencing much. Um, so what are your fears if we don't start to take the right steps, you know, as quickly as possible? And, you know, how would this affect our economy in the next one year? It's already affecting the economy as we speak. Don't you see what the prices are saying? Don't you see the cries in the market, even from the common people? If you go to any market, you see the way every day they change prices. There's so much uncertainty. So the consequences are already with us. And if you are not careful, it will continue to get worse. So I think it's a question of going back to the drawing board. There has to be further engagement. And I'm, I know that the economic management team have laid down some very fantastic proposals. But it's one thing to have the proposals. It's another thing to translate those proposals or recommendations into, into, into concrete implementation. So we have to go back to the drawing board. And we also need to engage the stakeholders. Nobody has the monopoly of knowledge. The economic managers, the policy makers should engage with the stakeholders on sectoral basis and on a general basis to address these macroeconomic issues and to also address sector specific issues. Because all of these things is also about holistic management of the economy. So that is what should happen, in my view. If you don't do that, the situation will continue to deteriorate and we will continue all this firefighting approach looking for this, going for this, asking for sanctions, bringing in EFCC and all of that, those things cannot give a sustainable solution. All right. Buddha Yusuf, uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, we will, of course, continue to follow uh, the figures, you know, with the Naira and the exchange rates. And, of course, uh, looking forward to having another conversation with you if things either improve or get worse. We'll have a very interesting Friday ahead. Thank you, Dr. Thank Yusuf. you. All right. Stay with us. Uh, we'll move away from talking about the economy and uh, the Naira to now talking schools. And Nigeria's out-of-school children seem to be increasing. And also, you know, what the security challenges have led to or, you know, have uh, eventually caused with the number of uh, school children that have been affected. We're getting into that conversation next with, once again, Jide Johnson. Stay with us.